The F major prelude from Book 1 is perhaps the least well-known of the theory. Um, unless you are going to play the complete uh, well-tempered first book, you are probably for some reason not going to learn it. Um, it's for example one that you would never hear in an international competition where it is mandatory to play in the first round a prelude and fugue by bar. I don't think I've ever heard it in that setting and I've never heard it in concert. In fact, so much so that when I played the lot, that was really the one of which I didn't have much of a clue. So at first I did what everybody does in this prelude. Most people, not everybody. And I did... And it was all right. Um, as has happened a lot, in fact, and keeps happening, more time passed, the more I wished to slow it down. And the more actually I started to get out of it. So it has slowed down by degree and now I have reached this point, which hopefully won't get any lower, where I do. Something like that, which is much more gentle, which gives the music time to breathe and exist um, without any sense that this is a digital exercise. And we are left very often in this book, and I've discussed it previously, in playing those preludes, mostly the preludes of the Klavierbüchlein, in fact, which were written after all as didactic material, as exercises, we are left very often with the temptation to play them almost as virtuosity pieces. And as I have said before, I don't think this applies for one thing because the concept of tempo ordinario in which I talked in more length in the C minor prelude, so episode two. Um, so, Yes, I prefer to take this piece in a, in a much more leisurely way. Now, when I do that, this also leads me to bring an accentuation which is a bit different of what you do when you play it fast. So... Something which is not altogether legato. Now, uh, of course, when you play faster, you don't really have much of a choice. So you... Uh, When you get a bit slower, the question arises. Interestingly, this question doesn't really arise on the harpsichord. We have this instinctive feeling that harpsichord playing is uh, more spiky than, uh, than the piano. It's actually completely the opposite. A harpsichord would probably even tie the bass. <laughs> In that way. The fact is, the, and that's where it reveals that the nature, the deepest, at the deepest level of these two instruments is fundamentally different. What works on one doesn't work on another. And that's something I will develop in subsequent episodes. On the piano, if you play this sort of bass legato, <laughs> It sounds like it lacks spine and tonus. On the harpsichord, it's perfect because the sound naturally has more brilliancy. So you always adapt to your instrument to make it uh, do the best of what it can give you. What you do on the piano is actually trying to imitate other instruments. And when I do that, I absolutely try to imitate a cello with my left hand. right hand. Again, it might be an oboe, it might be a flute. But all these instruments would never play legato. They would tongue it in various ways to highlight the, the natural rhythm of the music. 
and that the piano is very good at doing. If this prelude is a study for something, it has to be a study for trills. They are tricky and in fact they are easier to do on the harpsichord. Those long, long trills that you have, for example, piano they are less than ideal um, but we can't really play the piece without them because it would sound empty uh, those are the few moments where you can actually see really that the well-tempered clavier was not a well-tempered piano some of it works superbly sometimes you get an awkward thing which sticks out a little bit and that is definitely one of them the fugue is another of these really short and amusing one, like the E major we discussed before. Uh, it is modeled within the spirit of a dance, which is the passe-pied. It has all the characteristics of the passe-pied. This rhythm by three, quite strongly marked, uh, all of it, uh, Bach was writing a passe-pied in a fugal form. Um, I say it is amusing. It is. What I find the most well judged in this fugue is the way Bach has slightly tweaked his subject halfway through the piece to... Uh, I'll show you. That is the original. Now, halfway through the piece, he adds one note, which doesn't seem to do much, but he actually plays with it for the whole of the second half of the piece. You get to a point where you have it on the left hand. So instead of... He gets... And then you get this thing constantly until the end of the piece. I'll show you. the point where actually he just repeats it over and over and over at the exclusion of anything else. So that's really Bach quotes having fun with his material and we are having fun too, at least I am.